Did you remember to, to do the hoovering as you walked over to the kitchen? I don't do the hoovering. Do you know why I don't do the hoovering? Are you not trusted? Let me tell you. I'm too tall. Oh, really? Yeah. That is an amazing excuse. It's the truth. It's the same reason I don't do ironing. <laughs> because you're too tall. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't know because you're really short. <laughs> right. If you stood on a box and then tried to hoover, you would realise that you'd have to stoop to get... I disagree with that, but okay, carry on with your story. Okay, so I have to stoop and I have to bend my back down to reach the handle almost, moving around and pushing it forward and back. It's hell on my back. Now, ironing, same thing. I have the highest, tallest ironing board you can buy, which is 130 centimetres tall. <laughs> I <could> say. <laughs> and that's not high enough. I need something even higher. So that is why I don't do the ironing, because it hurts my back. Can, can you not put the ironing board on some blocks? <laughs> I've never tried that. Uh, do you know why? <laughs> because it's a good excuse not to do it. Because my wife is shorter than I am. <laughs> so she does it. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, that excuse has got me through 20 years of not doing the ironing. So if we could just carry on, that would be really good. <laughs> <laughs> I am Malcolm Childs and I am James Giffins and we are Just Making Conversation the show where we discuss the ins and outs of the model making hobby that we both love so much from the greasy sprues to the gloss coats and everything in between we are going to Just Make Conversation Remember, there are other podcasts you can listen to. Plastic Model Mojo. The Scale Model Podcast. Plastic Posse. On the Bench. Model Geeks. Sprue Cutters Union. Or you can head to modelpodcasts.com. Consider leaving a review or five stars as it promotes this podcast to more people to enjoy. Also, consider tossing a coin to us on buymeacoffee.com. It just helps us make content for you. In this episode, we will just be making conversation about promoting the hobby of model making. As model makers, we are thrilled if anyone takes a genuine interest in our hard work. We are super thrilled if that person wants to make things with us. Is it our duty to promote our hobby for the sake of the hobby? How do we get into the hobby in the first place? Did someone encourage you and support your interest in model making? Or did you fall into it by accident? Likely, someone bought you a model kit as a gift, and you were hooked. Let's launch straight into it, then. What do we mean when we're talking about promoting the hobby? As we do in some of these podcasts, we like to lay out the foundations, and we like to define our definitions, and just make sure we understand what we're talking about <laughs> before we start talking. So what do you mean by promoting the hobby? What is promoting a hobby? Promoting the hobby takes all sorts of forms. Obviously, the, the physical promotion, i.e. magazines, YouTube, where you're looking at particular kits, techniques, a product review, you know, tools. Like look, at, look at the tools I've got on my bench and how they all differ in how they work. Also, the, the of course, the, the promotion of the hobby itself by sharing the work that we do in model shows mm. and uh, obviously social media comes into that an awful lot as well. And then just inanely talking to people about the hobby in podcasts and other mediums. Mm. So promoting passively by just generally annoying everyone around you or actively going out of your way to gather the more uh, unsuspecting general public. Well, I think I achieved that all in one, really. I generally talk to people to death, annoyingly, until they submit into becoming a model maker. <laughs> Trail of corpses. There are a few. There are a <laughs> few that, that um, know when I'm working and don't come in the office because they don't want to talk to me. Well, they walk straight in and go, oh, no, and walk straight out again. <laughs> yes, or, or the uh, uh, blessing manager who goes, oh, how was your weekend? And I go, <clears throat> It's funny you should say that. I have had a very busy weekend with Madame again. Uh, let me explain. 
<laughs> get your phone out and start going through all the f- the videos that you've done and been on and the interviews you've had and all the pictures. Not all the videos, Malcolm. Well, it depends where you work. <laughs> you know, they should be bloody happy and very excited that somebody is interested in something in their lives. Uh, that's what hobby is about, isn't it? It's being interested in something else other than themselves. Yes. So for me, I've always asked the question, should model makers always be trying to promote the hobby actively? I kind of do already with the stuff that I do out of uh, just making conversation. Mm. Uh, But I also, when I'm at shows, I'm very happy to talk to anybody about what I've done or how I've done it. If someone asks me a question, I am beside myself with joy because I get to talk about model making, which I, I could do all day. It's half the reason why we started this podcast in the first place. And that is promoting a hobby for me. Yes. It's not about telling everyone in the street, go and start model making or get the microphone or something and standing mm. on a soapbox. It's if anyone shows an interest, if they stop long enough, then you talk to them about model making. That's what I would say promoting is. Yeah, but you also got to look at the point of view that promoting the hobby is is not necessarily, as you've explained, promoting it to an external source mm. of people that are not model makers people that haven't found the joys of uh, plastic and sprue and all the rest of it but it's also the the internal conversation you have with other model makers because you're promoting techniques you're promoting products you know you you might use a particular product that gives you a good effect Mm. and someone might say to you how did you achieve that and you say oh well this is what i used etc that's that's the same sort of thing it's just a lot of people don't realize you know especially in the social media world that we live in we post pictures up in facebook and on uh, instagram accounts and twitter and all all the other avenues you can post stuff up in mm-hmm. you're promoting that within hobby makers and and there are always going to be a crossover a little bit like when you get your you know your war gamers for example who mm-hmm. don't really do weathering which has come up quite recently through luke you know, Luke Carswell and what he's been doing. And he he was amazed that people that paint armies of of space marines don't weather this anything. It's it's that's how it is. But, you know, it's still a promotion and it has a cross pollination within within the the different facets of the hobby. Yeah. I think I've always tried to talk about that as well in our podcast, haven't I? Uh, it's something I re- I'm quite feel quite mm. passionate about. The, the the hobby, wide range of things. Um, from remote control to dare we say it trains bingo and yeah and all that mm. and all that in between all of that is is promoting a hobby or the hobby as we like to say it's interesting you talk about the space marines because there's a style mm. isn't there there's a style in wargaming where you do the edges you you, you line the edges with yeah. a lighter color don't you of the armor i'm sure everybody has seen it and that is kind of like the, the, the way that you paint those space marines. And that's obviously is a style, isn't it? Mm. That's a way of doing it to give a certain look. Like you said, like Luke comes along and then approaches his space marines from a scale model's perspective and says, oh, these guys are fighting on a moon planet, so maybe their feet would be dusty. So he puts the dust on the space marines. Then they said they've never seen that before, you know, chipping and things like that. And it's very interesting, you know, that he doesn't he doesn't follow the norms. And he comes from that background, so that's why his stuff looks so awesome, because he doesn't do all the edge highlighting like other people do. He, he, he makes them look more real, I mm. suppose. But I have to say as well, he doesn't really play much, so uh, it, I can't imagine him very excited about someone picking up his well, very, very well-painted Space Marines um, and throwing dice at them. I wonder if you could do it the other way. Do you think... You could paint a tank in the same way that uh, Warhammer and Games Watch promote the way that they paint their stuff. Yeah, yeah, you can do. I wonder if anyone has edge highlighted a Sherman or. I should imagine they have. I can't imagine. Well, I can't imagine they haven't. I haven't seen it. No, I haven't seen either. That would probably be actually quite a a bit of a curveball you've thrown, but it, it, that would be quite interesting actually to find. Those differences from the different areas of the cross pollination within the hobby, for example, do a Sherman, mm-hmm. so it's whether do a Sherman, so it's Warhammery to highlight those differences because there is yeah. there is a lot of things that, that cross over, but not in entirety. 
Uh, it would be interesting, wouldn't it? It would be nice to be able to give the same model kit to a number of different people who do paint miniatures from a railway la- layout person. <laughs> A, a row what are they called layout enthusiast uh yeah like like yeah. trainees trainees right yeah trainers no no it's not trainers oh. so no not trainees either, no. is it? model railway enthusiast there you go model railway enth- oh, i'm gonna cut all that out <laughs> <laughs> just have it like i know what i'm talking about model railway enthusiasts all the way down to, you know, all the way over, sorry, to remote control guys, you know, and, and give them the same kit to make in the way that they would do it. Get them all together and see the differences. Now, because they're different people and they do different products, they would be different. But focusing on the style, it would be really interesting to see how they approached them. Mm. I think there would be a lot of sim- similarities between the Warhammer and the model railway enthusiast. Yeah. Um, because it's not that long ago that the the thought of weathering a carriage on the railway scheme is big news i mean it was three four years ago or maybe maybe five years ago that that became an a, a thing and there was a, a a real um excitement through that that group of people because they were suddenly looking at weathering products and going what am i meant to do with this they're a little bit in forward in front of space marines maybe but yeah you're right it it would be really interesting to see to see that it's not something i've thought of before actually until literally while we're talking about it hmm write that down it's my second thing there you go we were talking about promoting cross-pollination between the hobbies, weren't we? That's, that's what we were talking about. And, and I guess it's because people uh, it doesn't really happen that much because uh, generally uh, people kind of stick with what they like. They don't kind of vary off uh, or don't get out of their comfort zone. I actually disagree with that, Malcolm, because within our hobby, if you think about it, we've got our, our dioramaists, we have figure painters, our tank enthusiasts, aircraft enthusiasts. And there are a lot of things that have cross-pollinated those four, even with our own hobby, so I think there's a lot of it goes on because of the the amount of promotion of our hobby within ourselves. It comes up every now and again, doesn't it, from people that you know, oh, that product's just a rebranded product. Most products are rebranded products. I've got news for you. You know, one of the reasons I I was looking forward to talking about this was because obviously um, the last two years have just gone past have been a very different couple of years. We won't go into it in depth but everybody that's listening to this will know exactly what i mean the world's gone a little bit crazy the hobby itself i think and and not just our hobby all hobbies or all, all all things that are out there um there's been an awful lot more conversations and communication through social media and video content on youtube etc cetera, etc cetera. because people have been at home and because people have been hungry for that sort of information and social interaction and social interaction of course yeah so i think from from a, a promotional part of the hobby I, I think we've been really really lucky these last two years in that we've had a lot more people doing content on 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 youtube in relation to live shows to in relation to techniques there's some um people that have been around for a long 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 time but not been around if you know what i mean uh, that have come back on the scene to to do their thing and share their knowledge, you know, so, so it's not just the uh, Uncle Night Shifts of the world, but there's other people. Mike Rinald is back on the scene doing some fantastic work with his, his YouTube, uh, you know, just to name a couple. There's loads more out there, of course. But there's also a lot more community as well. You know, we, we, we've gone through a period where we, we've pulled together as a community. We've supported each other through a strange time with community events, with, like you said, interaction because we're all hungry to, to mm-hmm. speak to people and stuff. So we've been really, really lucky. And I think it's had, a, in many ways, it's had a massive positive effect to the hobby, as well as some negative, but mainly positive, I'm glad to say. I think so, yeah. Just the fact that people have been at home, unable to do anything, you know, they're kind of wondering, what the hell am I going to do with my day? And uh, that's been great, certainly, for um, your bricks and mortar hobby shops and your your online purchases and all that kind of stuff mm. i'm just kind of just guessing from what i know i'm sure that's not the case for everybody but i certainly facebook groups have got busier i'm sure the sales of model kits are much higher i know the share price of airfix has gone up so 
it's a marker for something. Um, obviously, it's not it's not being great for all model uh, manufacturers. And some have gone bust recently, but they're, maybe the distributors are winning at this moment. But you're right. It's just people having more time. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Trying to fill their time with something, and perhaps they never had really the time to even consider having a hobby. And I know a lot of things were said like, oh, you should go get a hobby. You know, that'll fill your time. And so like, I guess people went and, went and did it. But I think also the other the other side to that as well, Malcolm, is that certainly in my lifetime that I can't I can't remember a time where someone has said to you, "Oh, get yourself a hobby, get yourself something to do, but don't leave the house." Mm. That's the, that's been the difference is that go and lose some weight, go and join a gym, but go and uh, go and find a hobby, go go walking across wet stones and whatever <laughs> while walking. That's the second time that's been mentioned now. Uh, yeah, I purposely mentioned it because I thought it would tie in quite nicely with the last time. But anyway. That you know, we we we've had a massive focus on hobbies where it's a case of get out, get out of the house, go and go and see the world and, and ramble and abseil and and uh, fly your kite or whatever. Mm. But I can't think of another time where someone said find a hobby in which you can do in your own four walls and don't leave the house. Yeah, yeah. It's limited people to their choices. I'm not saying that. People with people that are locked up in houses go, oh, I'll become a model maker. That's my only option. <laughs> well, maybe if you had something uh, braced to your ankle, which meant you couldn't leave the house uh, because of your asbos, <laughs> <laughs> it might be something you take up. But also PlayStations and Xboxes and all that, oh. uh, arcade games and things, I'm sure also uh, saw a massive spike oh. um, in, in users. But adult users as well, you know, not not just the kids signing up. Mm. People doing DIY, people doing their garden, for instance, like you did. Mm. We like to call it one-to-one scale dioramas. Uh, right. Yes. Or or just yeah, being able to carry on with your your work. You know, uh, some people weren't I, I, were were not stuck at home. In fact, they were three or four times as busy. Mm. One of the things I think about when I think about promoting a hobby is making paint. Tables that Airfix do, Brampton Model Club does, the Shuttleworth Group, and donate and create stuff that Models for Heroes do. That is a an active promotion of the hobby. It's like, come and look at what we do as hobbyists. Come and join us in this uh, daft hobby that we do. Come and come and have fun. And that that's the kind of promotion that I'm kind of kind of thinking of. You know, actually getting somebody else to join in and see what we get up to. Mm. I don't think there's any other raw promotion <laughs> of the hobby apart from showing off your finished models at a show and i don't know is that promote i suppose it is promoting the hobby but it just seems so if you're not actually making something i think that is the that's the hobby you're, you're making and building something that's the bit if you finish it and it looks great that's a bonus <laughs> for me <laughs> <laughs> um there's so many other little bits that i enjoy on the way um, and the finished articles, probably not the, the thing, but there's so many different parts of the hobby that uh, people enjoy. The, the model shows and, and showing your work, et cetera, that's, that's about inspiring people. Or, or that's how I see it anyway. Um, mm. Okay. Maybe inspiring is a little bit too strong, highfalutin, if you like, but it's it, it's a case of, f- for me personally, by showing your work, showing what you do, et cetera, you tend to to gather model makers that are, are already in the hobby but there are the occasions where you come across people that aren't in the hobby uh, and are like oh, oh i just love to be able to do that sort of thing a lot of the the shows are a, a mild form of promotion promoting yourself promoting techniques and what you do but it's internal to mainly model model makers but it does it does make a difference to people that are on the edge, if you like, of the hobby. So they're looking in, not sure whether to delve in or not. And like all things, even as a model maker, we tend to build things that we like. We tend to build something that we see a potential with. Yeah. For whatever reason, whether it be an inspirational picture or something very different or a favourite character from a film as a figure painter or, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so those sort of things, I, I tend to find those sort of things inspire people into the hobby because most people that are model makers there are people on their periphery so that you know their partners their children uncles and aunts all that sort of thing but that you know they're all people that until they 
see what you do. They have a potentially a very narrow-minded opinion or, or view when you say, oh, yeah, I make models in, as a hobby. It isn't until they actually see it that it, I've had it a few times with relatives. They Everybody knows I'm a model maker in my family. They, you know, they tend to avoid me at parties and all that sort of thing. When they've come around the house and they've come into the, the hobby room and, and seen what I've done, or they've seen pictures sometimes on Facebook as well, I've had a few comments from relatives that, you know, I didn't realise that's what you meant you did. Yeah, well, you just see it with your own eyes. Or well, maybe they hadn't thought about it. Well, that must make you feel really good because obviously they were in awe or they were um, inspired by what you had done. Hadn't considered the, the, the level of detail or the time spent, perhaps. The, yeah, and, and that's what I mean. It sounds, it sounds like I'm being a bit with my nose in the air by saying inspiring. But that is what I like about the hobby. I really do enjoy being in a situation where I have spoken to people that are on the periphery or not even considered the hobby. Mm -hmm. I can think of several occasions where I've spoken to people about stuff, shown what I've done and not done, and it's created an interest. They've gone into the the hobby in some form. Do you know what I mean? They're they're, they're doing things like bookends and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there are a lot of options it's nice to know that you've inspired somebody. It's a thrill. Well, yeah. You, you don't want to turn people off it. It's not no. anyone's goal, I'm sure, with any hobby. You want more people to enjoy it with you because you enjoy it. You want to share that joy. <laughs> I can't think of an example. I like my examples. Could you imagine if you had a model show and you say, um, you don't want to try this hobby. It's just too hard. It, it'll take you a very long time to uh, build up your skills. Don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> it just wouldn't happen, would it? <laughs> it doesn't no and funny enough we were we were talking before we started recording about the phrase gatekeeper and the fact that there are there are people out there that don't like to share or don't wish to share oh yes yes we were yeah. their techniques their hobby in the way that most people do that example you just given is is a typical example oh no you you it'll take too long to figure it out there's books go and buy them but generally speaking, in the hobby, we're we're very, in my experience, and I'm sure in yours, we're a friendly bunch. Yeah, you know, we quite happily talk to them about yeah. techniques, model making, and and all that sort of stuff until the cows come home, really. And those people that are labourers, gatekeepers, in my experience, and and what I've come across is very rare. But I've been very fortunate in the interactions I've had that I haven't really come across them. It's a word that I've heard a lot lately. My personal experience is I have never, ever come across a gatekeeper that uh, cock block me in. <laughs> well, for a better phrase, a uh, more fitting phrase, in, in trying to learn something, a technique or, or how to do something. I don't see the benefit. Unless I came up with some like oh, automatic way of painting something and go, oh, that's clever. Maybe if I sell it, <laughs> I'll make some money. Yeah, I, I need to get a paint on that before I tell anybody, yeah. Yeah, I just couldn't see that me doing that because that's part of the hobby is sharing what you've done and stuff. And we were talking about spaghetti just before the show, weren't we? We were, yeah. And that kind of thing. So uh, imagine if you, you went to a hobby shop and they were selling linguine, <laughs> tagliatelle, res- um, ravioli in packets in the model shop because they know that people are using it for different modelly things. That's not that's not techniques, is it? That's products. Yeah, that, that's someone that didn't get the chance to um, patent it, but they, they happen to have got a supply of pasta. <laughs> Maybe the mother's Italian. <laughs> Maybe. Are we going to go into the spaghetti? Or are we just going to leave it and let people wonder what the hell we're talking about? Quite happy to talk about it briefly. It, it came up in another podcast. It did. Who's, whose was it? On the Bench Crew. And one of their patrons had written in and, and explained that they had used wet spaghetti for piping and, and stuff on, on aircraft. I think it was aircraft. Uh, I, I do hope it's aircraft. Otherwise, it looks like I didn't listen to the podcast properly. And I gotta be honest, it was a bit of a jaw-dropping moment for me because I'm spaghetti. Did I hear that right? I did rewind. He did say spaghetti. Still mystified to a degree because what what you guys that are now listening to this podcast won't know is that Malcolm and I were discussing about how we would stick spaghetti to our model, and I said to Malcolm, in complete naivety, "I'm not sure what glue you would use," and Malcolm replied, "Starch." Yeah, the, the actual starch in a... You know where you unload your... Unload. What's the wrong word? <laughs> when you pour your spaghetti out of your pan, if you have one rogue spaghetti left 
in the pan, it dries and it's stuck to the bloody pan. That would be the physical sticking that I'm thinking of. Well, I'd have to try it, but I have to get some spaghetti, get my tank and chuck some spaghetti out and see what sticks. But what I misheard then of that podcast was I thought they were doing camo edging with the spaghetti, like you would with um, yeah. Blue Tack. Uh, yes. eels yeah so i thought well, oh, that's a clever idea because i was thinking of that, that kind of really thick tagatelli on your your tiger tank but you're saying it was it was quite well i've re-listened to it so I, I think it's a good idea it is a good idea i yeah i just I, they did say in that podcast was that they asked their listeners to write in with peculiar items that were used within model making that may be food orientated oh did they okay I'm really looking forward to hear. So if any of our listeners have used wet spaghetti, and I, I just clarify, it was wet spaghetti that was spoken about, not just spaghetti. It was had to be wet. If anyone's used that or any other food products in their modelling uh, process, then that's a little unusual, then let us know. Yeah, let the on-the-bench guys know, and they can handle that one. Um. <laughs> yes, yeah. I think they will be doing a, a food-orientated podcast at some point because there were other other items they spoke about. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking about it. There's a lot. There's tea leaves and oregano and all that kind of stuff people use for, for ground cover. Yeah. Because it's a fantastic subject. But would spaghetti be good filler as well? <laughs> if you had a seam, we've gone way off topic. If you had a seam line and you squeeze some wet spaghetti into that seam line, and remember, it's in a long, straight thing, so it's a nice, perfectly straight bit of filler right and let it dry that's gonna be some rock hard filler there isn't it It, it'll be sandable yes you're looking at me funny cheap (laughs) edible yes other (laughs) things that'll be good probably not fit for purpose at all probably would rot and shrink this is probably a terrible idea the theory's strong (laughs) it's a little bit like using flour for snow isn't it Uh, on a diorama yes I wouldn't recommend it at all. I understand why people might have used it, but um, discolours creates all sorts of problems. Maybe we'll cover that in, in our next season at some point. We won't steal it from on the bench, guys. We'll have to we'll listen to theirs and then do a different one. <laughs> <laughs> Something I want to ask you, actually, about the hobby and promoting... Do you think that the physical magazine, do you think that is sustaining its sales? Do you think it is popular or do you think it's dwindling? Oh, well, uh, I don't know. I have absolutely no idea about publishing. I have no idea about uh, writing articles. I have absolutely no idea about any of that. This is not my thing. But uh, for magazines, it's it's... The way I see it is that the general public are kind of perusing the the W. H. Smiths. You can get a magazine on pretty much any hobby at all, you know. And I'm talking any hobby, uh-huh. and so there has to be a model making magazine up there or two um, on the shelf. So someone's walking by and thinks, "Oh, that, that's a nice looking aircraft," or "That's a nice looking tank." I'll get that, and that'll promote the hobby that way, won't it? If that's what you mean. Uh-huh. But I don't know whether sales have gone up or down or, or what. I wouldn't even begin to guess. I don't know over the last 10 years whether magazine sales have dropped. I can imagine they have because of the internet. And I can't remember the last time I'd written a letter to a magazine. I used to do that a lot with newspapers, but I haven't done that in a long time. I don't need to. It was probably social media, I guess, that's killed that. I'm thinking. However, they are still awesome as a resource. Mm. Any magazines that I have are quite happy to give to somebody else mm. and say, go and read that. That will give you a bit of inspiration. You flick through it and go, oh, that's beautiful. I love that. How do I do that? The magazine will tell you. But mm. also it's, it's uh, full of articles about all, all sorts of other things. There's like show reviews and obviously adverts for products and stuff. It's all good for promoting a hobby, I suppose. But yeah, what do, what do you think then? Again, I don't know whether the, the sales are up or down. I know on shelves that that's, would stock those sort of magazines, there seems to be an increase in the, the amount that there are and the variety, if you like. So to my mind, it used to be a choice of two or three and they would cover pretty much aircraft most of the time and one would possibly cover anything other than aircraft. But, you know, you've got diorama magazines, you've got armour magazines. Most genres are, are covered. 
The only thing I've not seen, actually, thinking about it, is a, is a figures magazine, but I'm sure there's one out there. Oh, there is, yes. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's it's beautiful. You know, Obviously, they've got loads of beautiful pictures. It's quite a thin magazine on terms of pages, mm-hmm. and it's probably not very cheap because they're quite glossy. But uh, yeah, I'm sure it's got the word fantasy in it. Someone will probably put it on a Facebook let us know. There seems to have been a growth in the content so different things that are provided. And I also have a theory in that now I, I probably get shot down in flames for this because I'm sure our listeners will prove me wrong. But because we are model makers, we are the sort of person that's quite tactile. We like to touch things. We like to have it in our hands sort of thing. <laughs> and a magazine is definitely something in which you can flick through, etc. Whereas the internet version isn't. So I think, as a product within a hobby, I think people are potentially more likely to buy a physical magazine that they can hold in their hand rather than a digital copy. Uh, do you think there's a, there's a resurgence of the, uh, or, a, or a backlash, a return to the, the paper pages? I'm not sure it really went away. Uh, yes, it has dropped off, mm. definitely, because that obviously you've got more multiple ways in which you can get that information. I mean, if you think about, I mean, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to try and find out, actually. But if you think about, like, for example, caravan in magazines. <laughs> um, yeah. They're the sort of thing I can imagine that someone would uh, subscribe to because they're interested in caravans and port balloons and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but it's it's not something they need to physically hold. So it's something that a digital a digital way of looking at a magazine would be fine. Imagine the articles about portaloos or portable loos. Well, you know, you're sitting in a portable loo. The last thing you want is a magazine that's going to slip down the portable loo. No, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Mind you, would you have that same approach with an iPad or a uh, reading device? I don't know. I, I'm just <laughs> a Kindle. It's dropped down the portable loo in my caravan. <laughs> yes, I just chemically destroyed my Kindle. <laughs> Magazines as a whole, there's not as many of them on the shelves, i.e. there might be lots of choice, but there won't be a great big stack of them. I mean, I remember as a kid going to a shop and and the magazines would have a fair number there on the shelf for you to take. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go into, as you said, WH Smith, for example, and you go to the, the section where the model magazines are, there is a couple on there of each. But it's not just that magazine, it's all of the magazines. There's probably no more than three or four. Yeah. It's interesting, because as you're talking, I've Googled uh, weird hobby magazines. Some of them are, are weird. Miniature Donkey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pro Portable Restroom Operator, which is a magazine for people who work in that uh, industry. It's not about the loose itself. It's about the industry surrounding it. <laughs> it's a magazine about cranes. It's called Cranes. Crane enthusiasts. But just being enthusiastic about cranes, I don't know if that's a hobby. <laughs> Uh, another magazine here called Sheep. Yeah, very, very popular in Wales, that magazine. That was a low-hanging fruit joke, wasn't it? Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was much more of a serious thing because there was a lot of sheep farmers in Wales. 14 Flock Secrets, How to Clip Difficult Sheep. There's an article in that one. <laughs> uh, Modern Drunkard magazine. There's an article in there called I Busted Out of Rehab. Um <laughs> Serial Killer magazine, I'm assuming. I don't think that's promoting the hobby of serial killing. <laughs> I think it's promoting the hobby of being interested in serial killings. Uh, the really weird one, which I just came across, well, there's Emu Today, but that's not the really weird one, is Model Airplane News. Model Airplane News is featured on weird and wacky hobby magazines that you may come across. Right? Uh and I'm looking at it like going, I haven't seen that that one before. <laughs> now that's considered weird in this article. Yeah. Um, alongside sheep and lighthouse digest. <laughs> oh, isn't that interesting? It says about the model airplane news magazine, it says, Oh, yeah, please, I need all the news about tiny versions of airplanes that nobody can actually fly in. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> really? That's what it says. Tell you what that is. The person yeah, that wrote um, that is an armorist. He likes tanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Girls and Corpses magazine. Apparently as well as a weird one. Oh, my God. 
It's literally pictures of girls with their corpses. Is that to call one of them? Pitching a tent with Holly Stevens, apparently. <laughs> but interestingly, the, the aircraft model magazine is considered, in this article, a weird, uh, odd hobby. I suppose that means that we should promote it more, obviously. <laughs> People have con- misconceptions yes. about, about the hobby, I guess. Well, certainly this person who wrote this article. There's some there's some very strange people out there. The, why? Wow. Uh, okay. There's an article on the on the website called "So Many Corpses, So Little Time." <laughs> why is this on the same page as Model Aircraft Magazine? <laughs> you can't seriously put those in the same bracket. That's thrown me. It really has. Yeah, I just don't even want to. I don't even want to look at. I just not gonna. Sorry. <laughs> Ugh. Oh wow. Anyway, I'm gonna have to remove that from my well search history. Cracky. Um. So we we're talking about magazines. So um, model shows. We talked about uh, model clubs. Obviously, they're promoting the hobby and encouraging people to join. Yes. And talk about model making and help people get into the hobby. And I guess model shows, uh, sorry, model clubs would be the the old school way of getting people into the hobby. Because if people are interested in a hobby, they would look up to see what clubs there are in their area, right? That's that's what I did when I was getting back into the hobby many years ago. I just typed in to, to Google or I looked in, a, I can't remember how I found it, but there is a, a my local model club I just went along to their meetings and I learned so much more than I would have done just sat at home. But what I find interesting is the amount of people that are into the hobby that are not part of a club. And the number is enormous. Like you look at the scale model world at Telford, the people paying to come in who are not IPMS members, Mm. there is a hell of a lot of people paying at the door because they're not joined the IPMS. They're not joined a club. Break that down a little bit further. How many members of IPMS go to a club? I don't know. All of them? No, not all of them. That I would say there's quite a reasonable percentage of members that don't go to a club. Right. I don't go to a club. No. So what do you do it for? The the, the... I, I do it to support them um, and so I can go to the show. That's the only reason. Mm. I obviously communicate with people in different clubs that are part of that organisation, but I do it all online. Yeah. I don't go to a model club night purely because I have got such a, a lovely environment to make models in right now. Mm. The thought of packing it up in some form and taking it to some model club and sitting making models with somebody, although great that it is when, when that happens, but I would be scared that my model might get broken or or would I have the right equipment? Well, you should be surprised about model clubs that don't actually do any modelling at the model club. Yeah. My local one doesn't. It's bring what you've built or bring what you've bought or bring what you're building. It's not like yeah. coming along and sit down and build it, but it just means there's conversations you know, about stuff, which is great. And then there are clubs, obviously, that are building stuff as well. Now, if you're doing that in a public environment, and fantastic. Now, people are going to be walking past and go, oh, what's this then? But a lot of them are closed doors. So oh. You have to know where you're, where you're going. <laughs> the club that is the most popular one is the one that doesn't have a name above the door. The secret model club. Oh, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? So maybe that's a common misconception then. Yeah, maybe. I only really kind of made that observation because when I'm at Scale Model World, I'm watching everybody coming in. And mm. I was amazed the first time I was there at how many people were there who weren't part of the club. I thought it was all IPMS. It's not. You know, people who are interested in model making, Scale Model enthusiasts, people who like that, were coming into the, to the hall that weren't part of the IPMS. It's interesting. I found it interesting. Maybe it is, like you say, a lot more to do with the social aspect of, oh, this is what I've made and this is how I did it and we'll talk about it, that sort of thing. And again, the other thing you said was the fact that it's you have to go searching for it. You don't really see a, no. a regular advert from a local uh, hobby club. You might do, if you were looking at a model magazine, see a advert for a model club, but you wouldn't see it anywhere else, I don't think. It'd be in, in a modelling context, wouldn't it? You wouldn't be down the garden centre and go, oh, look, they've got a club. For model making, perfect. That's why I came to the garden centre. But isn't it strange? Because um, if you think about Facebook, Facebook, you don't generally advertise, do you? It's a case of you go on Facebook and you go, well, what group do I want to look at today? I'm going to look up this because I'm 
becoming interested in this. I have an interest in cranes. I would like to find out more. And then you join that group. (laughs) Do you think it is everybody's duty as model makers to promote the hobby? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Personally, I'm not sure how you feel. I, I think you probably feel relatively the same, but I think it's really important that, like most things in life, it's good to share knowledge and learn things. Part of the, the joy of this hobby is you have the opportunity to, to help people along the way and share your knowledge and become knowledgeable by that. One of the joys I find out of this hobby for myself is that I am somebody that prefers to interact rather than pick a book up and learn it. I'm not that I'm not keen on books. You don't have any books? No, I, I do have books. I learn quicker if I'm doing something. If I read a book about a technique and stuff, it, it takes forever for it to really sink in properly and understand it. Do you think that's why YouTube videos then have, have become very, very popular? Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. Because the, the, the problem with magazines and books give you a great example actually this it's um doing faces you know you can pick up a, a paint set with all the colors you require from scale 75 for example for for faces and in that has a little leaflet which explains to you step by step exactly what to do to get the, the most awesome face ever does it mm, yeah oh okay write that down i i, I have already no you haven't okay yeah don't don't lose that piece of paper <laughs> no I'll, I'll lose it immediately if we finish yeah don't get me wrong the description is absolutely brilliant yeah the, there are other companies that have done similar sort of things however the technique to to building up the colors and understanding the translucency of the paint that you require all these are big words to achieve that goal isn't something you can put in a magazine because if you say well if you do it this thin then do it again this thin, do it again this thin, do it this thin. You'd end up with like, you know, an A3 piece of paper for a three-step guide. Whereas a, a YouTube video goes through the same steps, explains exactly the same process, but you can physically see what the action is. So the translucency of the paint and the difference between building it up in very, very, very thin layers and not, basically. It's easier to copy it. Yeah. Uh, is what I'm thinking. And it's also because it's on YouTube, you have the opportunity to ask questions to the maker of that video almost immediately. Uh-huh. And so it's so it can be a two way thing. Obviously, if they're doing a live one, then you can have that interaction. You can't do that with magazines. Well, you, you can, you can, you can email them and, and get a response back potentially within a month, or you might even see it in, your, in a magazine at some point, if you're very lucky. Hmm two months down the line or, or however often. Yeah. Whereas a, a YouTube, if it's live, it's instant, it's there and then. If it's something you catch it up with or isn't live, then obviously it will be at the discretional time of the person that's doing the video. Hmm. But is the quality different? Maybe maybe the quality is different in a magazine. Maybe it's more considered um, rather than kind of ad hoc as it may be in a YouTube video. Uh, not in all cases, I guess. I think you the nail on the head with the phrase you use. It's easier to copy on a YouTube video because you can literally watch the video and go, oh, okay, that's how we do it. And then you can rewind it and you can pause it and then get all the paint on your on your wet palette that you're going to need. Move forward to the next stage. Okay, so the next stage, pause. I need to do this. this. So you can literally do it almost in effect at the same time. Mm. Whereas a book, you've got to read it, understand it, digest it, and yes, you can do it step by step. Of course you can. Same with the instructions on, on the paint that I mentioned. But there may be an element of, well, I'm not quite sure if I'm doing that right. Mm. And once you've gone three, four steps down that road, you're not quite sure where you made the mistake. Yes. Yeah. It's more of a learning experience rather than just you know, reading a book, which I guess it is. What about podcasts then? How are we promoting the hobby can we call ourselves podcasters? I suppose we can. We've been doing it nearly a year. Do you know, <laughs> podcast is, is a funny subject because I remember the reaction that I had when you first approached me about this podcast, and it was the same reaction I, I had when someone else had spoken to me about a podcast and was I interested, uh, which was, what, podcasts? How does that work? Is oh. it useful? And the thought of effectively mm-hmm. watching a video without the video didn't really make an awful lot of sense to me. And I do remember saying to somebody, well, 
you know, if you're talking about a particular model, I want to see that model. I don't. I, I, I want to see the sprues. I want to see you know new releases, for example. Great idea. It's lovely to know what's coming. I'm that sort of person. So I didn't really understand podcasts. Mm-hmm. However, with that waffle said, since doing the podcast and listening to the podcast as well, because obviously it's good to hear what other people are doing, I've found myself actually quite surprised how much information being passed to me through the, the medium of podcasts. So yes, we, we do promote the hobby, obviously. We, we take the fun side of things or we'll try and look at it from a funny point of view. But there are podcasts out there that are very serious. And it's informative. It's, it's also good to hear from some of the interviews with um, industry leaders down to the, the average modeler. Yes, it is a, it's a good form of promotion. And I think still grow more. I think there's still room for it more, really. I don't think there'd ever be no room for more. It'd be like, you know, it's the infinite magazine shelf. Yeah. More choices is, is better for everyone, I would say. You're right, though. When we started the podcast, I listened to a couple. Nothing to do with scale modeling at all. It was about hobbies hobbies in general but since starting this podcast i listened to most of the scam modeling ones i still haven't got around to listen to um small subjects yet mm. i will it's just great to have on while you're doing something i put mine on at work and i listen and if i if i can remember i'll put it on in the car but i guess it's just another medium to talk about the modeling mm. and it's a sort of more cerebral i guess it's not very cerebral in terms of intelligence but it's it's not it's not a visual medium no we're just chatting about the stuff that you can chat about. Yes. It's just making conversation. Just. <laughs> it's just making sense. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd go that far sometimes, but yes. Podcasts are an inter- interesting medium in-, in relation to promoting the hobby. I suppose, actually, thinking about it as we've been talking, that maybe the podcast is, is similar to those club meeting nights in that it's just a bunch of people sitting around chatting about models for no other reason than just to have a chat pretty much yeah we just talk shit. james we need a mooseroo update for the, the mooseroo enthusiasts yes so uh well wait we've... for the you gotta wait for the jingle mooseroo cup the mooseroo cup let's talk about the mooseroo cup boom Woo-hoo! uh obviously we've got the review out how did you think that? How do you think that went? Well, <laughs> funny you should ask me that. As as we were recording this, uh, well in advance, uh, I'm assuming it went really, really well. Brilliant. Well, I'm really looking forward to doing it. So whether it went well or not, it's uh, I'm looking forward to doing it. It's it's gonna go well. I have complete confidence in my co-host to um, make me look good. We're gonna take comments and chat from people, anyone who's watching or not. Um, if there's nobody watching, I will just make stuff up and, and chat to you anyway. We're going to start the kit from very, very beginning live and potentially I won't touch it unless I'm live. So you'll be able to see the steps in which I take to achieve the end result. Got you. Okay, cool. Unless something goes terribly wrong of which I have to fix that I might have to do off air. Yeah. But we'll tackle that as we go along. If you want to do something and you can't go live for whatever reason, then you could just do a recap when you get live. Yeah, there there may be some some paint effects in which I can't necessarily do live because of the noise that it will generate. Yeah, come and join us. It'll be fun, one way or another. What date was that on? So this is on the day after this goes out, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> isn't it? This goes out on the eleventh, yes. and then this and then the live show that we're talking about goes out the day after. So it goes out tomorrow. That's right. Yes. So it's not a case where it's got. We fucked that right up, didn't we? Well, listen. Th- this is this is the truth. We either have or will do a live show. <laughs> we will be doing a live show on the day after this has been released. So, realistically, if you're listening to this, it was yesterday we went live. But this of podcast actually went live, which was the day before we went live. As long as I've not confused anyone, I think I've got that clear. I'm so. I think I might have time dyslexia. Is that a thing? <laughs> Just the concept of. Doing something in advance just completely baffles me. It's like time travel. That's why you're not allowed to drive the McLaren, you see. McLaren? No, <laughs> DeLorean rather, not the McLaren. <laughs> McLaren makes prams. <laughs> well, you're not allowed in the pram because it's too low anyway. <laughs> you, this, that prams are too short. We had to get the highest pram. 
so that when we were pushing it wasn't hurting. Do you know, I couldn't push the pram without kicking the back of it all the time. Mm. And that's not because the kids were in it. Mm. As I'm walking, my gait was too long for the pram. I... And when I asked for a pram that had a longer gait, they didn't know what I was talking about. Because obviously I hadn't ever come across somebody taller than six foot two. Eight. I don't know why <laughs> the only short people could operate prams. What is that? About? Eight hours later. Yeah, it's a real struggle. It's a struggle. Anyway. Yes. We were talking about promoting the hobby. And I asked you, do you think everybody should have a duty to promote the hobby in some mm -hmm. way? Should they be trying to push? And we talked about gatekeepers a little bit. Or goalkeepers. I can't remember which one <laughs> And I was interested in knowing whether people had started the hobby because they were promoted to by someone else who promoting the hobby, or if they started just by falling into it by accident. And I can imagine that most people were just given a model kit for it as a gift from Father Christmas and started building and just fell into it that way, rather than actively being promoted to. And I would be interested to know what you thought. I think a, a lot of modelers have come into the hobby because their father did it, uh, a relative did it. The relative didn't want them mucking around with their stash, so they bought them a model. Mm. Or quite often, you, you tend to find that it's it's a sibling thing. Like, for example, myself, the reason I got introduced to the hobby was my brother started doing model making. Oh, right. I wanted to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Does he still do? <laughs> no, he doesn't, actually. Ah. Um, uh, he's he's a good model maker. It's been a long time ago since he did any, and I'm talking about when I was quite young. We had a park ray fire, which for those that don't know what that is, it's basically a, a, a coal fire with a metal surround and glass glass window. Um, so it's not an open fire, but it is an open fire with a door. So um, it got very very hot, but was really good for drying things, but not plastic. So uh, he put his heart and soul into a plastic model and he was so chuffed and proud of it that he um, wanted it to dry quickly uh, and he put it on top of this metal top to the fire and uh, unfortunately you can imagine it just melted and all his hard work. And it just so happens I'm showing the same kit oh, wow. to yeah. Malcolm right now. This is a Tamiya German 8-ton semi-track 20 millimeter flak gun it comes with four figures or five figures i think it's five figures and it's obviously depicted in a winter scene the reason i just pulled this off the shelf is because my aim is to actually build this mm. for my brother and give it to him as a present basically the original model that he made i still have it's in my box of tricks and the reason being is because it fascinated me how the model melted it kept a reasonable amount of form when I've used it in when I was when I was much younger. I've used it in dioramas as a, a burnt out shell and the figures that he painted and these figures were very good actually. Wow. Okay. So I've actually got those as well. So I, I will build it for him at some point. I desperately want him to get back into model making just so we've got something in common really more than anything else I suppose. Well, that'd be nice. Uh, a nice way to promote the hobby to him, wouldn't it? Back to him. I have tried several times. Um, don't get me wrong. He still has an interest, a keen interest in work, and that reflects back to we were talking about model shows and stuff. He's the sort of person that wouldn't be a member of a club but would be happy to go to a model show and have a look at the finished products and would be inspired and excited by them, but unfortunately not enough to get over the disappointment he suffered as a youngster. Well, it's probably hurt a lot. I, mean, I can imagine that it was devastating for him. Yeah. I thought you were going to say he was hiding his stash and he hid it in the fire. No. Uh, well, to be honest, I, I've tried to get him back in a hobby several times, and each time he said it is that he said to me, you're so much better than I am anyway. So I was or, or or could have been, so I don't want to. Yeah, and it's sad because he's he's a he's a an incredibly intelligent person and, and very crafty with other things. So that's how I was introduced to it. I suspect you're right. I think I think a lot of people will come into the hobby in, in that route i.e a older sibling or parent or uncle or something trying to in install a little bit of quality time with a youngster yeah mm -hmm. it's been interesting interesting chat that one enjoyed it yeah it's been good fun yeah i like that one i i can hear the music in the background oh yeah so it means we need to stop now 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it works, isn't it? Allegedly, yeah. <laughs> if not, you just fade me out anyway. I would never edit you out, unless it was, like, on purpose. <laughs> Though not in every case, you will find most of the regular model makers are only too willing to share their passion for the hobby and those interesting ways of how to achieve the right effect. But isn't sharing our passion for the hobby just a part of being a model maker? You've been listening to Just Baking Conversation with James Skiffins and Malcolm Childs. Follow us on Facebook, where we post photos, updates, and other nonsense. Let us know what you are just making and what your thoughts are on the conversation on this episode. A big thank you to our supporters. Mike, Robert, Andrew, John, Mike, Jeff, Richard, Lynn, Gordon, and four others. Who took the time to buy me a coffee. If you would like to grind some beans for us, come join us on buymeacoffee.com. If you do show your support, why not leave us a message? with your name so we can give you a shout out next time we will be just making conversation about our first year of making podcasts it's our birthday Woohoo! goodbye goodbye and take care yeah i was at the station today the station i was at has a level crossing at this level crossing obviously the cars are waiting for the train to go past and i saw a jogger came up and I stood with great fascination watching him stretching, which is all foreign to me because obviously it involves exercise and I don't understand it anyway. But mm-hmm. it, it got to the point where I'm not quite sure if his, um, his underpants had gone into nether regions or not, but he seemed to be trying to pull them back out in the way in which he was stretching without actually physically hooking them out. The moves that he was doing made you think that he was trying to remove his pants from his crack. (laughs) Basically, he just, all of a sudden, his face changed. He looked very uncomfortable. Mm. Got to happen. We all do it. How do you do it socially acceptably, though? Yeah. And doing the half yoga position was quite entertaining in itself. What's a half yoga position? Where you stand on one foot and put the other one flat in. Do you know when you sit on the floor and you're doing your yoga and you've got your feet um, he was still standing, so he had one foot. Was he levitating? No, he wasn't levitating because he had one foot on the ground. Right, so he was standing on one foot. It's a half yoga position where you can get your foot up. up like, oh, yeah, he's got your foot up. And I'm like, yeah, you're very nimble, very cool, but you look like a twat. Is it called the lotus flower? Is it called the tree? Is it called standing on one leg? Like that? Is it called the flamingo or something? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's called the tree. It's called the tree, Jane. He was doing the tree. No, it wasn't the tree. His foot was in his crutch. Well, the- look, look. It wasn't like that. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Wait, up, up here. Yeah, I can't do it. But you know what I mean. It was literally. It's called the tree. I'm sure that's it not the tree. What is the tree then? Well, when you've got your foot against your knee and you've got your hands up in a triangly sort of. Look at me, I'm a tree. You are supposed to be able to get your heel against your testicles. <laughs> so is that what you're saying? He had his heel against his testicles. <laughs> Move on. That is the tree. That is the tree. The height of the foot depends on how good the tree poses. So, so when I watch him tomorrow, I can say to you, well, that's a tree, that is. You'll be doing, you're doing a tree. It's a bit windy. Aren't you meant to like go like that in the wind? No, that's the Cure concert. Ha, 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 ha.